Welcome to the podcast, Life After Addiction and Indictment. I'm your host, Steve Cloward, and I spent most of the last decade and well over $100,000 on coaches, consultants, masterminds, and events trying to figure out how to reclaim my life again. On this podcast, I'm going to share the tools, the tips, the tricks, and the hacks that allowed me to forgive myself so that I could reclaim my life again. I'll be interviewing experts in mindset, leadership, entrepreneurship, sales, marketing, branding, and so much more. I'm glad you're here. Sit back and relax and enjoy the show. Let's go. This is Life After Addiction. And hey, folks, welcome back to Life After Addiction and Diamond. Today, I've got a special couple, um, two doctors, the, uh, the Brockbergs, who are joining us today, and they are doing some very great things that are impacting our veterans uh, with addiction issues. And so I appreciate you guys taking the time and want to welcome you to, to you to the show today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. Appreciate oh, it's my pleasure. Well, first of all, tell me how you guys met. <laughs> so yeah. We're not going to get into the big relationship piece, but I, you know, I'm just curious how you guys met and yeah. how you both, you know, were you doctors before? Did you, were you in school? Give us yeah. a little background on that. So I'm actually originally from the East Coast. Uh, Dustin and I were here in Minnesota at this at this point, but um, we met in our PhD program at UW Madison. So go Badgers! All um, right. <laughs> yeah, we met we met during our our program and um, started dating and ended up you know getting engaged. There so it's kind of this really cool story, and we've. I guess that's kind of uh, intertwines with our book and we've had some academic writing experiences together in the past and um, that's very cool. we're ready to jump in together with something like this. So, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. In fact, as, as I was doing a little research last night, I was looking at your website and one thing I saw, you know, your mission, and I want to read that because I really liked it. It says, we believe that the mission of finding relief from pain and recovery from addiction shouldn't be, uh, be covert or secret. Silence about these challenges among veterans is dangerous, both for veterans and for people who love them. We hope our work will inspire and inform a new conversation about what pain and addiction are, how these things show up in veterans' lives, and how to cope and recover in a healthy and productive ways. I mean, that was, to me, that was said so well. And uh, tell, tell me, you know, whose idea, how did it come about to do what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, so I, I work at a large residential substance use treatment center in Minnesota, and, um, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's actually part of the whole reason why we got into this predicament of being able to write a book, right? So, um, so I, I work for Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation, and Hazel and Betty Ford has a huge publishing wing as part of their um, myriad of, of, of uh, ways to kind of help those not only in addiction, but also in, in recovery. And so, I was actually speaking at a at a, a virtual conference, and I unbeknownst to me, there was somebody in the, in the the audience that was part of that publishing group, and I got approached oh, to, wow. you know, like, hey, would you ever be, would you ever want to write a book? And I was like, well, I, I mean, when I was five, and I thought that'd be cool to write a book, <laughs> book sure, right? But not so much now as an adult, and um, and I said, you know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll give it a shot, but under one condition, and that's. Um, my spouse has to come on because she's the much better writer. She's very much smarter than I am. So, uh, so I think that was really important for me to kind of put that together. But Smart in man, all reality, you always got to marry this, you know, someone smarter than you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But in, in all reality, you know, I identify as an Army veteran, and um, you know, thank you for I, your I, service, by the way. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and 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 the firsthand experience of just wanting to give back to that community, but also give back to the community at large that's impacted. Uh, or cares about veterans, or um, even just has issues related to mental health and how that can be applied. And so, um, you know, a part of our book is just talking about those issues, but there's a whole other part of it, which is pain. And yeah. I, again, I, got, I get a glow for a second. My spouse is a pain psychologist. So bingo, that's an awesome marriage right there. And um, it just kind of <laughs> organically came to be. And then fast forward, we're at Starbucks every single weekend writing a book. And no here it is. Yeah. That's cool. And the, and the book is End Your Covert Mission. That's the title, correct? It says A Veteran's Guide to Fighting Pain and Addiction. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so a big part of the book is being able to have an honest conversation about um, really changing a person's gear, changing a person's mental state or mentality around 
um, how to work through issues, how to work through addiction and pain, but also to be able to um, acknowledge that the, the, the stuff that you were doing used to work, right? It used to be good tools that helped you survive unspeakable things. And yeah. we want to honor that. We want, we want to fully respect that. And we have to find a new relationship with those things as well. I think that's just so important. I don't know if you guys heard this or not. I'm not a big TV watcher, but one show I do watch with my wife, I will admit, and uh, just as of the last couple of years, for some reason, I thought it was stupid when I first heard of it, and, but Survivor, the guy that won last night um, donated the entire million bucks, all of it, to a veteran foundation. It was one of the most inspiring, coolest things, really. It was It was fantastic, but, you know, I actually uh, had a foundation back in 2003, non for profit called Bands for Freedom Foundation, and we raised uh, a bunch of money to donate to the Armed Forces Relief Trust. With my background, you probably can't see it, but that camouflage wristband says freedom. We donated 255K just by selling that. And the reason I bring that up is I actually was born on an Air Force base in Victorville, California. My dad was a dentist in the Air Force. And so I really didn't have, even though that he, you know, he was in the Air Force. He wasn't, you know, active or we didn't move around or anything. I mean, I didn't remember anything about that. So I didn't have a background of military or really understand what they do. But when I did this foundation, I got involved with the Armed Forces Relief Trust and military.com. And when we would make check donations, it would, you know, we donated to the Armed Forces Relief Trust. And they took me down to, it was in Jacksonville, Florida. Every time we donated, it was on an NBC live affiliate, which was phenomenal because that really pushed our sales. But they took me down there after we did this donation in Jacksonville, Florida. And I don't know what base, but one of the aircraft carriers was coming in that morning from Iraq. And I will never forget the feeling I had. I mean, it makes my hair stand on end right now. The families that were there waiting the air, you could have cut it with a knife. It was so intense in a positive way. And so as I got that experience and a few others, and, and you know, it's hard for me to talk about without getting fired up, honestly, because we've got to take care of our veterans, man. It's just something that, I mean, it's something I'm actually passionate about. So I love, you know, what you guys are doing and your focus, because I mean, you guys will probably know the current rates. I, I know what they were, it's been some time, but how many suicides a day what do you know what it is now? I mean, back when I was talking about it, which is like 0405, it seems like it was seven a day, but I think it's quite a bit more than that. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a pretty large uh, PR movement, not PR movement, but but a big movement that's being talked about. More and more exposure now of the the phrase is 22 a day. So on Jeez. average, it, it was it was it was that. That's just hard to believe and understand. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that right there for all the listeners out there. I mean, if you know of family members or friends or anybody, you know, if you don't know what to do, at least thank them, you know, for what they've, their service, because we do not know the scars that they come back with, you know, it's got to be just intense as heck, depending on what they experienced. If they were in the wars, I mean, they've seen some intense things that, you know, really have a major effect, which is what and you guys can, you know, give more insights on this, but obviously, if they're abused and opiates after they're done where they may have needed them for pain, obviously they're numbing pain of a different type. Can you talk about that and kind of what you guys see, you know, when it comes to that? Because I know that's what, you know, that's why I was abusing. What pain is it, you know? And until you figure that out, you're going to have a hard time staying sober. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just want to say too, since we did bring up suicide, um, you know, a great resource that has just recently come out is the 988 number. So I think a lot of times, you know, we know 911, but 988. So 988, I'm going to put that in the show notes. Yeah. And that's a, that's a really a good resource right now. Actually, I think it came out actually after we wrote our book. So we have like the, yeah. So we have the suicide talk, I think, or specific to veterans in our book. um, Cause we do talk about, you know, um, dying by suicide in the book and how that impacts veterans. Um, but 988 is the new resource that I think that there's a lot of promotion with right now. So just oh, you know, want to want to drop that. But um, yeah, that. great point, Steve. So pain being how we talk about it in the book is this idea that it's not just 
physical pain that people experience, right? So right. when you hear pain, kind of the more universal understanding of that is that, you know, there might be physicality, something that people go through over time that might be impacting their body. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we find that veterans are a little bit um, more open to talking about the physical pain they've gone through. Um, whether that be like a resiliency piece or, you know, kind of a badge of honor of like, this is what I yeah. went through and here's the what men- I can show for that. Yeah. Psychological mental pains. I bet it's a totally different story as far as opening up, isn't it? You're already reading my mind. So, you know, part two and three of the book is we talk about emotional and social pain. So emotional being more of the mental health pieces, dealing with anxiety, depression, PTSD, grief, grief being really oh, heavy. Yeah, for- lost yeah, friends, At- been in war with them and things like that. Yes, absolutely. And then moving into more of the social element. So coming back, um, you know, there's a lot of social things that people don't think about re-entering into the work field or trying to just reintegrate with your family and friends that might be at a very different spot than you're at you know, coming out of the military. So well, there can be probably in socially, there could be a lot of things, depending on, you know, what, whether it's noises or situations that probably even trigger certain things, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of triggers that, um, you know, we might, we might constitute or kind of connect back to to trauma, but there could also be triggers to even just feeling a certain way or feeling disconnected or feeling alone that um, we, you know, a veteran can't necessarily prepare for all the time. Right. Um, You know, uh, she was also talking about the idea of grief. One of the one of the other aspects of that is grief of what you are not involved in, right? Grief of missing mm. holidays and birthdays, grief of missing opportunities, or uh, your friends getting through college and you're just starting. Grief of um, a lot of just things that we almost take for granted. I would have never thought of that, but that's yeah, that's that's a massive issue. I bet. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. I, go ahead. I was just saying, we even talk about loss of spirituality, you know, oh, there's, wow, yeah. there's a lot that happens that I mean, they, they get to the about. point where they're not only feeling alone, they probably just feel like empty, you know, and just, mm-hmm. yeah, just, we probably can't even understand it really until you've been in their shoes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that's where a part of our book comes into play is um, we want to, we want to try to understand, try to validate and, and, and understand a person's shoes that they're in. Um, with the caveat that we can't fully know that, right? I mean, I think of the, the great example that, that I once had is um, when I was overseas, there was a moment where we encountered a situation where um, there was some, some gunfire going off, right? And when we all came back to the base, there was like 20 of us, we all experienced that differently. Yeah. Right? We all had a different mentality of that was really frightening, that was really awesome, that was cool, that was weird, I think nothing about it. And so there's all these different perspectives. And I think that's a really yeah. important idea to think about not only mental health or trauma, but also thinking about the pathway around addiction and recovery, right? Everyone's path is going to be really unique to each of them. And, um, and this book is trying to really, really resonate and connect to that mentality and give really like easy ways to understand, like, here's a good step to take in that direction, right? But it's still you that has to walk in that path. Um, right. And, you know, something else that, that you mentioned earlier on, this idea of kind of like, well, why this book? Like, well, what's happening now? And uh, I forgot to mention this idea, too, that um, if you go on Amazon right now, you will find tons of books from one veteran telling their whole story, their whole narrative of this is what I experienced. Love mm-hmm. it. We need those books out there. They're important. There's also a bunch of academic theory, brainiac. Let me just kind of spit things at you and cite everything and just kind of be ivory tower on you. Yeah. Also has its place in it, right? We need to know what the theory is doing, right? This book is really a meld of both, right? We want to be able to talk directly to the veteran. You're going to see swear words in there. You're going to see a lot of examples in there. You're going to see a lot of tr- like strategies and like key things you can do with something, but also honoring that you might be at different stages of when you're reading it, right? Yeah. And that that's really important because um, this topic is heavy. You said it yourself that this is a very intense thing and we respect that. So well, it affects so many um, people. That's, you know, does. there's so many people that it affects. Yeah. And so I think it's just, this is an important added piece to that, that, that this book is really trying to fill a gap in, in the literature right now, but to really give a space for a veteran to kind of re- open up a book and they immediately feel connected to the material 
And, and, so and it is also not even just for veterans. Anyone that's connected to veterans could still yeah. connect to this book. Well, that's fantastic. It sounds like, yeah, I mean, with your perspective and experience you've had in working with them and things and, and hearing insights and whatnot, you know, you're able to bring a perspective that probably, like you said, isn't really out there. And I think, like you said, I mean, I'm not a big reader, but I mean, I have a lot more in my later years, last several years, but if the book doesn't, you know, speak to me or grab me pretty quickly, it's over, you know? And so I think that's fantastic that you guys have been able to, you know, understand that and really try to put something together that is going to, you know, grab their attention and really help them out, you know, or, you know, like you said, could be a loved one or a friend or a spouse or whatever. And I think it's just so important because, you know, people need hope because I know when I was using there was days I would drive to work literally crying because, you know, this is 22 years ago and it wasn't as talked about. It wasn't as, you know, it wasn't as an open topic. And, you know, there's still a lot more shame, at least I feel um, associated with it. Um, it wasn't ex as accepted as a disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was like, the reason I was really like crying is because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, but I didn't know what to do, you know? And so a book like this or, you know, or the loved one who doesn't know what to do, you know, if they can find someone to reach out to that has been in their shoes, because that's one thing that I always, you know, my belief is, is if you're going to, you know, get help from somebody it doesn't even matter if it's addiction, a mentor of any type, it ought to be a mentor that's done what you're trying to do or experienced what you, you're experiencing and what wanting to change. Um, and so, you know, until I found that person that had been through it and understood it, that could really guide me, you know, I just, there was, it just wasn't talked about it. So I didn't know as, you know, my options for resources or, or, you know, even who to reach out to. And so I think this is, you know, the pride is a killer. <laughs> um, and if, you know, if I could say anything to those listening and then I'd like you guys insight on what you experience. And if you see something that helps break through that is there is nothing to be ashamed of, man, especially if you're a veteran. I mean, we all have things in our life. We all have experience, we, you know, that create the situations we're in and the way we feel, but we have the choice if we want to face it and do something about it. And once you know you have a problem, then you have the chance to fix it. And as cliche and as horrible as I hated this saying when I was using, you know, like this too shall pass. You can get sober. It's painful, you know, it's not easy. But if you have the right resources and tools, you know, people like you, book like yours, um, and people love to help. And so, when it comes to reaching out, if you can set that pride aside, as hard as it might be, there's people like me that I'll drop anything and everything yeah. if somebody reaches out to me that needs help when it comes to this, pretty much anything. So is there anything that you guys, you know, professionally can mm -hmm. can provide that, you know, you've seen or, or that you can, you know, give the audience that might help, you know, them understand you know, how to maybe address the person or if it's somebody in addiction, you know, what the first steps would be for them to reach out to. Yeah. I mean, I think I love so many things that you just said, Steve, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> but you know, one thing I, I think that really stands out is, you know, finding that community, finding those people, your person, if it's not, exactly. you know, and that's, that's a big deal. Someone that you feel safe with and comfortable with and someone that you don't feel like will judge you and will accept you where you're at. Um, you know, and that might be a, another vet that might be a non-vet that might be a professional. It, it could really be anyone. Anybody, yeah. um, and I think that that's the thing from this book's perspective. We really try to help folks understand, you know, be how, how do we be people that can be open to folks that are going through this um whether that's even yourself that's going through it or someone else that you know that maybe you're reading the book and trying to connect better with yeah um and i think that's the biggest message i i like to give is that 
trying to create a space of openness, acceptance, and not being judgmental because we're all going so through true. different things, right? Yeah. And if we can kind of lead with that foot forward, then I think that we would find that there'd be way more connection rather than this distance that we're feeling. And some of the distance that maybe even we feel like we're creating because we're not sure yes. how people will respond to us, right? So yes. that's kind of my biggest thing. That's what I, I really um, find myself in therapy, working with vets. That's a big part of my, coming from someone who's not a veteran, obviously I have a husband yeah. who is a veteran, um, but I find you guys are a that, power couple when it comes to what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank awesome, you. Awesome, man. Um, but openness has just been so key and letting, you know, whoever you're talking to, whether it's a veteran or someone else that's going through pain or addiction, um, kind of open up at their own pace and just be there for them. And that means so much more than I think people oh. really understand. No yeah. kidding. In fact, when I, when I got indicted on another difficult topic but um as i started to talk about it because i was open about it i wasn't i had nothing to hide and frankly i wasn't i knew what was going on i knew the situation but it's amazing how when you speak out about a situation how people come out of the woodwork mm. that either mm. have experienced it or have a close family member who has and how much that helped me and so just like to what you were saying you know if they can be willing to speak out to that person they're comfortable with. You just never know, you know, and just so quickly you'll find that you'll be able to connect with people that are experienced of experience, just what you've experienced that all they want to do is help. But like you said, it just comes down to that openness and acceptance and, and not shaming people. It really comes down to just love. We, we just need more of that in this world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring that, 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 that piece up. There's kind of two pieces that I wanted to speak to. One was, you know, this concept of pride is interesting because it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there's many people in the world that are very proud or prideful, but I would argue that veterans are probably up there on the echelon of people that are pretty proud of them, yeah. proud of themselves. Don't kick my them. butt. Um, <laughs> and, I hate it. And, and, and a lot of people are also proud of them, whether or not they, yeah. they, they choose to accept that. And um, I think, you know, a way of looking at that is pride is also a survival mechanism, right? But we often convolute that with, is that pride, is that confidence, or is that, is that being strong, right? And, and those can all get melded together into one ball, and then you either take all of them away, or you keep them all together. And so I think that's where that can be a, a disconnect for a lot of people, is if I no longer am proud of myself, does that mean X, Y, and Z? Well, no, that doesn't mean any of that. And pride is actually probably what's killing you more than anything. Yes. Um, and so... You know, I often ask a lot of um, a lot of veterans, a lot of folks in general that I work with clinically, this idea around if we were to you know flip the script here, we were to talk about this exact same scenario, but somebody else is going through this. What would you tell them to do? And you probably say twenty things: get help, do this, do that. And then I ask, well, why? How does that make sense? Why, why are you different here? I don't understand this. And and there's this moment of like, wait a minute, <laughs> right? Like like maybe I can take a bit of my own advice here, right? There's there's tons of research on veterans that are that they'll drop anything to help another veteran. Very what? similar to folks in recovery, right? So and true. If someone's struggling, they're there within minutes, they're at their doorway, like I got you, right? Yep. And so we have that mentality in it. We just don't always internalize it if I can do that for myself, right? And what so a great way to that, turn that around for them to right. see that. I mean, right. that's it's, brilliant. So, so yeah, so I think that, that that's an important piece of that. And, and there's a level of, you know, then I, then I wonder, okay, well, where does this belief come from, right? If we, if we reach out for help, where is the, the assumption that no one's going to show up, right? Now that could be based in actual events that happened back in their life. And this is trauma-based and, you know, whatever, that makes sense. But oftentimes we struggle to actually get an answer for that because we, if anything, we see the opposite. We're helping, we're jumping for everybody else and helping everybody else out, right? So we have a lot of evidence to say that that wouldn't happen, right? But somewhere along the lines, we have this belief of it is going to happen to me and we have to deconstruct that. It's so interesting how, how so often, at least I had this problem a lot and I tend to still, I catch it now because I'm aware of it, but how we put others first, you know, we truly cannot help that person to the best of our ability if we're not whole, you know, and we can't, I like to also say that we can't love that person the way they need to be loved if we can't love ourselves first, you know. Right. Um, but have, is your, as far as 
you know, them speaking about it, talking about it from a prideful standpoint, do you ever find that they feel like it's like weakness? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I think a way of looking at that, you know, I weakness is a, it's, it's like, like we're programmed, word. like you're, you know, you're a man, especially these tough <laughs> got veterans that have, you know, these are real men and, you know, they might feel yeah. that that's just weak, you know, and real women. men don't cry. And and yes, women. correct. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> Thank the you. strongest men and women I know yes. are in the military, with military. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would say weakness is not typically in the vocabulary of many, many military members. Oh, I'm sure. There, yeah, right? I'm sure it's not. Um, and it, it, it's interesting is even in, in our book, we talk about this really old standing theory of this need to be kind of strong and kind of where that comes from and how the military often utilizes that to function, right? So um, it's kind of like, like, like uh, as a way of looking at it in, 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 in like a team standpoint, we don't want to be the squeaky wheel, right? You don't want to be yeah. the one person that's not on, right? So that mentality gets ingrained in you that you got to stay good. You got to be good. And then, so when you come home, and, and I call this kind of the Facebook effect. You go on Facebook and everyone's doing yes. great. And everyone's having babies and having jobs, and marriages, and all this stuff. The positive. And, I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, well, why am I not having that, right? Why am I the only one that's not dealing with this? Which A, is not true because no one posts the bad stuff. Amen. Um, but that also then suggests that we make the assumption that we're the only one struggling with mental health or addiction. Yep. And that's just not true. That's but right. if, our, if, our, if our lens is only in that mentality that we are weak if we are this, then we're going to fall into that trap every time. So um, again, these are just some of the many things that we that we bring about in this book too. Of kind of just being really direct with you. There's not a lot of fluff in it. We're just kind of coming at you. Like, and I think that's, this is that's why you're just why this is happening. That's and, the way it needs to be. I mean, yeah, I think we've yeah. gotten too soft, which is not done anything positive to help you know help people. When I went, you know, when I talked about the weakness, I was kind of thinking and referring to like seems like a lot of a lot of us used to grow up here and you know you know, real men don't cry and blah, 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 things like that, you know, and it's just, first of all, that's BS. And, you know, so, you know, I was just thinking subconsciously, there's a lot of that probably inside, but then, you know, you go in the military and like you were saying, you know, it's totally a different level of training and mental toughness and, you know, et cetera, and not wanting to be that squeaky will. So, you know, it's, they're probably on a totally different higher level of film. Like if they speak up about, you know, their struggle that, you know, they're just something's wrong with them and they're just not tough, whatever it is, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, and I think one thing to talk about here at this point is a lot of times the training too within the military is you don't talk about it, right? You got to push forward. Yep. You know, you can't let your friends and family know you need to keep going forward. This is the not the time to process. So at one point in a lot of veterans' lives when they were active. Um, that might have been very functional and a part of their survival. I, I got to yeah. keep going. I can't expose that part of myself right now. And that's too vulnerable to go there. So in some respect, you know, when you get out of that setting and that's not a part of what needs to happen anymore, we find veterans do stay in that mentality and then it hurts their relationships. It hurts their their jobs, they're going back to school, it hurts themselves trying to get through their own mental health. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the mentality of, um, and, and I guess, connecting back to our big metaphor in our book, which is, you know, it's time to clean out your rucksack, which is, you know, there's certain tools and strategies you have had in the past that may have worked, and maybe they work at certain times, but some of these older tools need to be updated and we need to see how they don't work for this new setting, right? You're not going to use a, a Phillips screwdriver on something that needs a flathead, right? Yep. We just wouldn't do that. So, you know, sometimes those tangible things are, we, we can see them and understand them a little bit more when it's an actual, you know, you're putting furniture together, but when it comes to us, it's a little bit harder to understand, wait a minute, that previous tool of withholding, you know, the pain and not showing weakness, that doesn't work anymore as a veteran. Yeah. Um, so we're really trying to help folks, you know, recognize that and then also provide the tools of, okay, if you're going to start showing those things, how do you do that in a, in a way that feels good to you? Because that is the scary part. That's the work, right? That's right. The, the part that, you know, yeah. holy cow, you you know, do I turn to substance in this moment? Do I do X, Y, or Z instead of, you know, not dealing with the pain or that's how I'm dealing with the pain. So right. 
um, it's, that's a big part of our book is let's give you some tools on how to do this and li- leave a more or live a more um, healthy, effective life. So right, right. Yeah. And I, I think off of that too, you know, sometimes one of the most human responses when you feel like you're kind of losing that control is to try to have a lot of control, right. To try to yeah. almost overcompensate for that. Right. And I can't, I can't even tell you how many times I've, I've talked to, to, to veterans, both you know, clinically and personally, just this idea around um, almost like an anxiety when you are in an uncomfortable situation or a situation that you can't control, like being at a target or being at a concert. And you're like, I can't stop this. I can't, I can't control this. And then, so then we, you know, jump to medications. We jump to substances to try to counteract that feeling to kind of come back down to a zero. Yeah. Whereas a veteran is pretty used to staying at about 50, right? Where I'm already going to stay elevated because yeah. that's kind of my norm. Um, and, and I think there's a level of kind of having just, again, some honest conversations of this is not working anymore. This is not yeah. working. Yeah. I think what you, you were saying, Carrie, you know, I, I remember as I was getting sober, one of the tools that was so important that, that, when you're thinking about, you know, going and medicating for a certain situation, you know, you've got to know and you that you have at least that one person. Hopefully you've got two or three, but that you will know, at least that one that you can reach out to and just be straight up and honest that you know they're gonna have your back. They're not gonna, you know, shame you or make you feel guilty, you know. Um, because that was something that I struggled with, honestly, um, until I could tell I was able to make that my wife, which it was not for years. Um, she was a nurse and, and ironic enough, anytime that someone would show up at their office that has issues, you know, they would call me. But if I had an issue, I did feel like that loser, you know what I mean? And so it took a lot of work for mainly me because I needed, you know, she doesn't know if I don't ex- speak, you know, um there's a, you know you don't want to live in expectations you want to live inside of agreement so you can't have an agreement if you don't talk um and so once i was able to do that you know that was a huge tool um because it you know it helped it worked every single time um but it doesn't matter who it is but you know you know that was just a big tool for me um because otherwise i kept it in and then i would fail you know and anyway but you know what um say for the spouse because you know whether it's movies or you know i have a friend i've heard it from you know you when you have veterans you know whether it's man male or female that you know may have some trauma or some ptsd um that that affects temperament um you know if you have that spouse that you know maybe is struggling because that's you know the veteran is getting triggered and you know and going zero to 60 um where you really can't have that kind of civil conversation oftentimes you know what advice would you give the spouse to be able to kind of address that that's a great question um and i've worked with a lot of spouses of veterans as well so um yeah so this is definitely something that is really tricky right? Especially when you're managing um, anger and how to approach that. Um, uh, Sometimes, you know, folks and veterans or non-veterans, you don't even, they don't have that awareness that they're going zero to 60. Right. Um, And in the moment, right? Sometimes it feels like, let's try to conquer this problem right now while this is going on. But the problem is, is when that happens is that oftentimes the individual that is so amped up they can't access some of the logical thinking that they typically would if they were more relaxed. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that I talk about is actually like coming up with a, you know, joint plan together prior to these incidences, if we can, right. Um, And in the moment, if you can't, you know, if you haven't talked about this, let's say you're just like, well, we're just starting in this now and it already happened. Right. But trying to recognize that, sometimes we need to cool off, calm down, relax, and then come back to, it doesn't mean we're ignoring the situation. It doesn't mean that we're avoiding what's going on. It means that we're recognizing, wait a second for us to have more of a civil conversation for us to feel like we can access some of those logical thinking, rational thinking 
um, thoughts, we, we have to be in a more relaxed place. So that might be, you know, as the spouse, maybe you physically remove yourself and say, yeah. I got it. I'll be right back. Or if you have some sort of plan in place, like, Hey, you know, you got a safe word, or if we've got, you know, some, remember that conversation we had, I yeah. think this is one of those times and let's reconvene at a different point. But, you know, we, I, in, kind of um my work I call this de-escalation right we okay. need to de-escalate the situation before we can have more effective conversations and if it and hasn't then, been talked about speaking in that moment is not going to do anything positive <laughs> probably not not Both when you're times. at that level <laughs> yeah. yeah not when you're at that level and then once you are in a place where folks are you know more calm we're relaxed and we can talk more I mean you're still going to feel emotion and passion oh yeah it's hard to be in that situation. Yeah. Um, but then that's when we can start to navigate a little bit. How more aware are you when you go from zero to 60? A lot of times people aren't. They don't oh, yeah. recognize they're doing it, right? Oh, yeah. And, well, and right. And how does that impact me? And how does that yeah. impact you? How do we work on this together? How can I help you in that situation? Is there anything I can do? Um, is there anything that you need? A lot of times it's funny, like, we think like immediately we should say, you need to do this, you need, right? <laughs> yeah. And this needs to change this way. <laughs> Let me tell you, as soon as someone hears you need or Amen. they shut down, <laughs> they shut down. <laughs> so yep. sometimes we need to ask like, what can I do? What, what, can, what do you need in this scenario? And a lot of times folks will take a second to like, wait a second, you're asking me what I need when I get pissed off? What? Yeah. Oh uh wow okay so i probably do need something if i feel like yeah right so if you're in that place you're probably irritated dealing with something so um you can have you know way more productive conversations after that de-escalation and then there's lots of ways to have those conversations but again i think pinning back into let's be open let's try to better understand at what level people are understanding their actions their words what's going yeah. on so yeah, that's that's important. Anything you want to add there, Dustin? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's uh, of course every time that we, we we bring up a new topic, I have eighteen things I want to say. So, so you have to be <laughs> careful to contain me. Um, you know, I think you know your original question around the idea of what to do in that scenario. I, I think and Carrie brought up some really great points, and it, which reminding me of actually is one of the the reintegration issues that often doesn't get talked about in the military, and that's for example, if somebody deploys they're gone, let's just say for a year, hypothetically speaking, um, and they come back to a family system that's changed, right? They no longer, that person hasn't been a parent for a year in that sense in that system, right? They've, all, they've always been the parent, but they haven't been a part of the all the decision-making or all, yeah. the, all the consequences or all the, whatever it is that's happening. And so a lot of times there's just a miscommunication because it's been some time apart. And a similar thing can happen when somebody goes home for good, you know, life after the military in that sense yeah. is the reintegration part can be a, one of the hardest things can be how to communicate again, because you learn one way to how to communicate and whether that was virtual or just very quick or whatever it was to now we actually have to sit in this, in this kitchen and talk it through. And I don't like this. This is uncomfortable. Yeah. This is too much. This is, I want, I want to break right now before we even get to it, right? And so there's a level of figuring out kind of that new mentality. I think there's an also an, almost like a deeper layer to that is, you know, this idea of being able to try to understand each person and kind of where they're coming from in those situations. Uh, a great example is if a veteran is having a nightmare and they wake up, right? It, now yeah. for a spouse or a, a kid, it's pretty scary to watch that happen, um, but it's just as scary for that veteran. Right? Yeah. And so you can almost join in that in that mutual emotion that you're both feeling. Yes, it's coming from different contexts and different reasons, but that's actually a great way to start talking about it. Right. Yeah. You may not go into all the details and do all those things, but at least then you found your person. You're finding your ally by just being able to have just let them in a little bit and join in that. And so um, I, I think communication is hard, but it's also the answer to that exact question. Yeah, yeah what I've heard. Go ahead. Beautiful. Yeah, Dustin, beautiful. I think that reminds me of something we wrote in our book about, um, ha ha, we, you may have heard the saying, don't make an ass out of you and me, ha ha, so, yeah. right? Let's not assume. And yeah. 
that is a great example of that, of, you know, assuming that someone comes back and you're going to get back into the same communication patterns with them that you previously had. Woo! Probably not, right? So we got to develop some new strategies, some new ways of talking to one Man. another. So yeah, great, great example. Uh, yeah, it was great. So, I mean, what was resonating with me, I was just like, man, being proactive to address these things, you know, is key to lay out that communication, you know, so that you, you can be ahead of it if possible. Right. I mean, even, even if someone gets deployed, talking beforehand about the, the possibility of whenever I come back, depending on what goes on. I mean, when you said someone has been making the decisions for a year, and then all of a sudden the second spouse enters, man, that's going to be all sorts of chaos, right. you know, right. because how do you just, if you don't really communicate, which like you said, it's hard, but you just got to commit to doing it, you know, because it has such a positive impact if you do it right. And, you know, sometimes we might need help from people like you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And actually you just said a key word there, you know, one of our, one of the tangible next steps that we talk about in, in this book, I'm only going to give you one so you can go out and read some more, but uh, is this <laughs> idea of, proactive versus reactive coping and this is a concept we really don't talk about right so when you have pain you take a pill when you are sick you take some medicine when you are down you go do something to feel better if you're feeling anxious you try to bring yourself back down right it's a reactive response to something that's going on in your life we are horrible at being proactive in coping right kind of getting ahead of the game and maybe this book is part of doing just that is idea of, let's yes. get ahead of the game now right we, we can, we're laying out this foundation of all these things you might be encountering. Let's start being proactive and trying to change them versus if we kind of just sit there and react to it, that's a horrible position. For any vets out there that are listening to this, that's almost being in like the defensive position versus being in, a, in an offensive position, right. right? We can sit there and wait for it to happen or we can do something about it. And I think that that is really that mentality of we can be proactive in communicating, hey, this is going to be hard for me. Hey, I'm going to have nightmares. Hey, this might happen. Hey, I might you know, pop off, whatever it is. I'm not, it's not personal, it's not intentional. And that can, yeah. it can bring so much of that down by just being that five seconds of honesty in that, right? Yeah. Um, so I, th I think the proactiveness is really important. Yeah, I think that that applies in this topic and business and you know, really almost any talk. If, if you can try to be ahead of what might be coming, you know, it's going to benefit you every single time. So, man, there's hard. <laughs> it hard. is very hard. It's so, like, so easy <laughs> to say, no so doubt it's about not it. Simple. It's, it's hard. Exactly. Yeah, this is easy stuff. Yeah. That's not so simple. true. Yeah. But, you know, and I think that oftentimes that intimidates us. You know, mm -hmm. nobody likes to really, you know, face things that are uncomfortable, let alone uncomfortable and hard. But it's so worth it, you know, yep. because I've been on both sides and I still, I'm not perfect by any stretch. I'm not going to try to paint that picture. But, once you're aware, you know, you're giving yourself that chance to really make a difference. And if, you know, I can't imagine the dynamics and how difficult it is in a marriage, but, you know, if you love that person, you want it to work, you got to do that work. You know, it's like, if you want something to grow, you got to water it, you know, because as tough as it can be, you know, the grass usually isn't greener. And so it's just a matter of commitment and putting in that work. But, you know, if you do, at least my experience is it can be beautiful on the other side, you know? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. But you guys are like a wealth of knowledge and I know you've got a kind of a hard stop here shortly. Um, but like, if you're open to it, I'd love to have you guys back maybe and have like a part two and, and dive a little deeper in some of these topics. I'm going to get your book and read it in the meantime. Oh. And so I'd love to have you come back, you know, maybe after the first year sometime when you've got time and, and just, you know, I just think you guys have so much value that we just got to get it out there because, you know, life's hard enough, man. And to have that stuff that a lot of these veterans go through, I mean, we, we owe it to them to do anything we can to help them, you know? And so. Thank you. That's awesome. I'm, I'm so excited. Yeah. And definitely some of the topics we talked about today too, um, I'm actually doing a webinar on communication here. Oh, wow. Um, so a little bit more into the nitty gritty of that. If you know, you're wanting that, uh, link Heck as yeah. well, um, that's it. through Hazelden. Um, awesome. I think it's a free webinar. I'm not 100% sure on that. Either way, I'd love to have the link and, you know, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'd love to actually check it out and also share the link, but that'd be right. awesome. 
So yeah, if you if you can send me that uh, an email, that'd be great. Um, but I'll like I said, we'll. Is there any last things you you want to leave today? Um, I'll have all of your you know social media contact information where people connect with you guys, as well as your information on where to grab the book. All that links, everything's already set up for the in the show notes. But is there anything you'd like to leave as we kind of wrap up? Absolutely. I you know I think uh, one of the biggest things that um, I say this a lot in a lot of different ways, but uh, take a chance. Um, put your foot in the water and tap it. Just see if this book can Amen. resonate with you. Um, if this book is hard. You can always put it down. If you're chewing on something, that's okay. Um, one of the biggest things that I've found since this book's come out is the amount of non-veterans that are coming up to me um, and saying, hey, I know someone, or hey, um, I have a family member that's a veteran, or hey, I just really like this chapter. We really, really kind of connected to it because we really, we really wrote the book in a way that anyone can grab on to these topics, right? We have, we have kind of a context around veterans and there's a level of anyone that's going through recovery, going through addiction, going through mental health, going through pain, it, it resonates with a lot of different people. And um, again, like I said earlier, we, we, really, we, we write it in a really no-nonsense direct way. Um, we know your time is valuable. Great. So let, let's- I let's, love that. Let's use that I mean, let's, yeah. I'm a meat and potatoes guy. So yeah. I'll tell you what <laughs> I want to do. I'm going to do this. For anybody that wants that book, the first 25 people, you just want to send me a message. You can send it through my Facebook DM. You can find me on LinkedIn. All my information's in the show notes. I'm not going to put it here, you know, even though anyone can go look at the show notes, but send me an email. I'll put my email in there. And if you want the book, anybody that's, you know, if it's a struggle, if you can't afford it, whatever it is, the first 30 people that want it to message me, I'll buy it and send it to you. Thanks, Steve. That's awesome. awesome. That's really cool. It. No problem. I just want to thank you guys for your time and uh, look forward to staying in touch and, and bringing you back. And I just want to thank every veteran out there that hears this or any loved one of a veteran, go give them a hug and tell them that, you know, we appreciate their service because we take too many people take it for granted and uh, it's life-changing, you know, and we just have too many people that are willing to do things that are hard for people that don't have that DNA to comprehend, frankly, at least that's where I'm at. But I learned to understand just what a sacrifice it is and we need to help them any way we can because they deserve it. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. all right. We well, appreciate it guys. We'll, yeah. we'll be in touch and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Hey, Thank take you. Take care. Thank you. Meet Backbone CRM, the most powerful platform to get five-star customer reviews on autopilot. Not to mention it's built on the powerful Google cloud ecosystem for fast speeds. But wait, that's not all. You'll have SMS marketing with drip campaigns, reputation management, two-way text messaging just like a cell phone with pictures as well, a unified conversations inbox for email, SMS, social media integration like Facebook Messenger, Instagram DMs, Google My Business Chat, website chat widget, all in one single unified conversations inbox. Isn't that awesome? Backbone CRM is the all-in-one automation platform to get customer reviews on autopilot and communicate with your customers all in one unified inbox so you never miss a customer again. Built for small businesses just like yours. Backbone CRM. Automate your business.